Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and delve into the challenges and impact of each technology in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. The Invos monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise noted. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers received funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for this speaking engagement. For this segment of the series, a discussion on the value of NEARS in clinical practice in the NICU, we will discuss the challenges associated with premature neonates and the value of NEARS monitoring. To help provide insight into this topic is Dr. Scott Duncan, Professor and Chief Division of Neonatal Medicine, Department of Pediatrics at University of Louisville School of Medicine. Let's begin by looking at some of the challenges associated with the premature baby. We all know that survival at the extremes of prematurity continue to improve. This study is a meta-analysis of slides, of, of studies rather, they're published between the years 2000 and 2017 and looks at the overall prognosis for survival of children born at 22 to 27 weeks gestational age calculated as proportion of all births, of live births, and of infants transferred to neonatal intensive care units. It's obvious from the slide that survival increases with increasing gestational age, and for those babies that are taken care of in a neonatal ICU. This next slide looks at the secondary outcome, which was survival to discharge without severe neonatal morbidity, defined as any of the following. Severe interventricular hemorrhage defined as IVH associated with ventricular dilation, that is a grade three, and interparenchymal hemorrhage defined as a grade four. Cystic paraventricular leukomalacia, stages one and two, necrotizing enterocolitis is defined by Bell's criteria. Stage three or higher retinopathy of prematurity and or laser treatment and or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. You'll note that the morbidity decreases with increasing gestational age. I don't think anything on those two slides shows us any, any great surprise, but we do know that those edges of viability continue to creep down and down and down so that we're resuscitating babies oftentimes that are 22 weeks and up. When we think about the common disease states and complications in the premature baby, we think about things such as respiratory distress syndrome, retinopathy of prematurity, acute kidney injury, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, late onset sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, interventricular hemorrhage, and patent ductus arteriosus. The long-term cost of care for these babies is significant throughout their lifetime. We think about the areas of care that we provide Within the healthcare system, we attempt to standardize care. As each of you know who take care of babies, that actual delivery of care often needs to be individualized. Here we look at three areas of care that present significant challenges to the patient and the caregiver, including cardiopulmonary resuscitation after delivery, respiratory failure, and abnormal cardiovascular function. One of the most simple caveats behind this entire discussion is going to be we need better monitoring. Invasive monitoring in children and in infants is technically challenging and difficult. Shock is often underrecognized and treated late, and ischemic organ damage remains a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in our patient population. So let's look at some of the value that's associated with NEARS monitoring, first by looking at some of the alternatives, followed by what NEARS measures, typical values, and then case studies and interventions. 
So here we see a listing of what some of our routine monitoring entails. We look at saturations, arterial saturations, which really is a systemic measure of the arterial oxygen availability. We look at pulse oximetry. We know that pulse oximetry requires pulsable blood flow. Neither one of those indicates that the delivery to the individual tissue is adequate, but more what the global oxygenation levels are. We can look at mixed venous saturations. This gives us again a global picture of oxygen usage, but may not be able to detect regional organ compromise. We can look at blood pressures, either cuff pressures or invasive pressures measured through lines. Those targets are often based on gestational age, which may or may not be sufficient to ensure adequate organ perfusion. We can look at urine output. We know that that is a late indicator of regional hypoperfusion. We can look at individual lab values, such as lactate and creatinine. We also recognize that those values are a single point in time. They're an accumulated value of minutes to hours before the actual draw. And they're also considered a late indicator of insufficient oxygen saturation or tissue damage. The advantage to near infrared spectroscopy is that it's not invasive. It gives you a regional picture of oxygenation of tissues rather than a global, global picture. NEARS is like a tissue mixed venous saturation. It allows us to inquire if that specific tissue is receiving adequate oxygenation. One way to think about NEARS monitoring is to look at the idea of routine monitoring versus responsive monitoring. Routine monitoring would be that that occurs before the clinical sequelae and is really designed to prevent or to minimize tissue injury. This is different from responsive monitoring where the monitor is applied after the clinical sequelae has occurred and tissue injuries either ongoing or has already happened. Consider NEARS as a first alert system and a system that, or as a system that's responsive to change. You can also think about it as a leading or lagging indicator of what's going on physiologically. Ultimately, our goal is to support optimal end organ oxygenation and to minimize hyperoxic, hypoxic, and or perfusion related organ damage. For example, respiratory monitoring is informed by arterial blood gases, capillary blood gases, entitled CO2, pulse oximetry, and pulmonary examination, none of which really represents the measure of the end organ oxygenation. And as an example, arterial blood gases and capillary blood gases, again, represent that single point in time. Pulse oximetry represents that global oxygenation and is pulse dependent. Traditional respiratory monitoring is inadequate to assess sufficiency of organ oxygenation and perfusion. NEARS gives us this non-invasive monitor of in-organ oxygenation, allows us to choose the intervention and subsequently measure the response. Please tune in next week for a new segment from this series wherever you find your podcast. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. Thank you for listening.